have a fun one. We're doing another episode of our series, the uh, Rock and Roll Detention. And we have uh, my friend uh, Chris from Metalomania here. We have Bill the Rager from the Metal Mayhem ROC Correspondence Pool. And we're going to have a fun one. Tonight's episode, what we're going to do is we're taking a deep dive into 80s bands that are possibly, that they flew under the radar. They weren't as big. But it's these are uh, like four or five bands that we enjoy. That it's our guilty pleasure, if you will. And I actually have one that uh, dips their toe in the '90s. So uh, right off the bat, you guys don't know each other, uh, Chris, uh, the Crypt from Metal Mania. Like to introduce you to uh, Metal Mayhem ROC Zone, Bill the Rager. You guys get familiar. How you doing, Bill? Nice to meet you, brother. Very nice to nice meet to you. Nice to meet you too. And, and thank you for having me tonight, Johnny. I appreciate it, sir. You're you're welcome. So you know what, Chris, I'm gonna give you a chance to uh, talk about your brand. Tell our listeners what you got going on. Tell Bill what you got going on. It's real exciting stuff. We are entering year seven of Metal Mania. Thank you for uh, those of you who already know who we are. We basically we've gone through hell and high water to be able to play music on YouTube, which is you know a crazy bar to get over. But basically, we interview bands from all over the world, and we've been very lucky. We've talked to Testament and Overkill and. Uh, in fact, next week we have Atrophy coming on. You know, everybody knows Atrophy's back together, and I'm, I got uh, them coming on to talk about it. And I like t- to think that our brand is replete with crazy ass editing. Is kind of what sets us apart, man. We do crazy goofy editing over here on our show. So editing is an understatement. <laughs> I had a chance to be a guest on uh, Metal Mania uh, about a year and a half ago, and when I, I finally w- when I finally watched it. I mean, my man, uh, hours and hours of editing inserts of cool little video assets, little, you know, jokes, this and that, uh, top production and tons of respect for you, bro. So again, it's Metalomania, find it on YouTube and we'll have all the links right down on the show notes. Please do, please do. Your support is what we do it for. We, we appreciate every one of you. So, so what we're going to do tonight, like I said, we, um, decided to go in the back of the vaults. We each combined probably have well over 120 years and counting of heavy metal experience. We all have our favorite bands. Bill and I are old buddies from the seventies growing up in Rochester, New York. That's where I am now. Bill's down in Florida for a second stint at uh, living in Florida. Nice. Uh, okay. Chris, where, where are you located? Where are you calling from? I'm 20 minutes south of Washington, D.C., right in Chesapeake Beach, Maryland. Yes, indeed. Did you grow up there? Is that where your roots were? Maryland. I grew up in, in PG County, and I'm a little more into the over. I, I moved closer to a beach is all I did. But, yeah, I'm a Maryland boy through and through. Yes, sir. Okay, and, and, cool. And so it's true then. So growing up in New York, there becomes an age where you're like, you have no choice. You have to move to Florida. It's like <laughs> it's, it's, it's genetic, right? The, the It's like the calling to the south, right, brother? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Awesome. I, it it called me down. I got. I love. Are you loving it? Oh yeah, absolutely. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, well, Bill is going to share his um experience. Um, Bill, I'm sure you'll get into it a little later, but give us the 30 second timeline. Rochester, Florida, the first time for you. Uh, I moved from Rochester to Tampa, Florida, in 1993. Lived there for 10 years. Um, did the whole. I, I was in a band. Went to many, many shows and then uh, moved back to New York and then was in a couple bands and many, many shows. And, you know, and uh, now here I am back in Florida, not in a band at the moment, though. But, uh, um, you know, it's all right. I think Tampa, I think death metal. You know what I mean? So that's what it was pretty yes, much. Sir. Well, awesome. <laughs> and we are going to touch on that. I know uh, I think we agreed on five five bands we're going to explore and i made a list of 37 but yeah five is yeah i have four (laughs) (laughs) you have four okay well let you know what let's go on four because uh we like to keep this going so we'll we'll go round robin we'll start and you know what we're we're a courteous guest we're gonna have chris our guest from metal mania start things off with um you know descending order i don't know if you have a one or a four you know, whatever, we're going to share them all. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I didn't really put them in order so much as just to make the list. And I, I'm not kidding. I ended up with like a, a list of like 40 some odd bands and stuff. But but let's open things up, I guess. with Let's let's go with the shirt I'm wearing here for especially this for this occasion, man. I feel like Heathen is one of those bands that never reached that 
level that I feel like they should have, man. I and I, you know, I just saw them about a year ago. Uh, and they're they're back together, they got brand new music coming out and that sort of thing. But they were a band that seemed to I'm a well, let's let's preface this quickly. I'm a thrash metal guy. I'm in my DNA is thrash metal. My favorite era ever was the Bay Area explosion of thrash metal. So, you know, a lot of my friends moved out there and that kind of thing. But Heathen seemed like that band that was right on the cusp of as they were starting to get big is when everything started turning grunge, I guess. And you know what I mean? They didn't quite hit that moment where things were and they should have, man. They're a fantastic band. They're still a fantastic band. One of the best vocalists in the game, in my opinion, you know, so uh, I, I'll open up our list with good old heathen, man. Fucking David. And you know, what's funny is a really good friend of mine, Kyle uh, Edisi, who is in a band called Invicta, is traveling with heathen right now as their as their traveling guitar player. So that's pretty cool. Right I'm not on. that familiar with heathen. Bill, are you familiar with this band? Uh, I, I was a long time ago and I kind of I, I lost my. Uh my cd that i had so i'm i'm out of uh touch with heathen but yes i i i definitely used to jam them back in the day 1987's breaking the silence is a mandatory own for thrash metal fans especially out there man i know and i i'm remiss that i don't have it in my collection at the moment fantastic well, release well i'll put it on my list of heavy metal homework right off the bat i have it on there <laughs> Yeah, and well, Victims of Deception in 91, and also they just put out Empire of the Blind a couple of years ago. Still a great band, still out there doing it. Check them out. Sorry, right so I didn't mean to cut you off, Johnny. Sorry, oh. brother. Uh, Bill, well, what do you got? What's your first entry? Uh, my first entry is Obsession. <sighs> from uh, They started in 1982, and they I guess you could consider them traditional slash power metal, sort of speed metal. They weren't really thrash, but you know they uh, they had elements there. For sure, and, great riffs. Sorry. Yeah, another band that that should have been bigger than they were, but they probably just didn't have the right marketing. You know, um, I remember they did have a video on 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 uh, what do you on on MTV there, and it, it didn't get much coverage. But uh, they're a killer band. They put out three to me fantastic albums: an EP and two full lengths. And, and then did uh, they have martial law? Was that yes, obsession? Mar martial law. That was their yeah, EP. Barbara then they had scarred for life was their first full length. And then um, methods of madness was the third one. And actually their very first thing they, right after they got together, they, they were on metal massacre too. Uh, mm. What's the name of that song? Uh, That's Juj right. That's right. Metal, Ma that compilation, those mass, those compilations were amazing by the way. Yes. Shadows of steel. Them. That's a tune that was on there. Beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful sick vocals killer twin guitars um i would say you know they weren't total shredders they were more like the tipton downing type uh playing right. I, I guess you could say but right uh, the back and forth attack yes and then uh mike Vicera, the vocalist had some sick high you know he wasn't a high-pitched singer he was more of a raspier voice but he could hit some serious highs i mean it was like a a siren wail <laughs> yeah <laughs> great band man great band cool well well, like I said, I have um, four or five bands, but I got a couple from Florida, a couple from Canada, and one from the U.S. But let's start with my first Floridian band, if you will. Started uh, in the early 80s. First album came out in 85. And the lead singer Magical actually made an appearance. What's that? Magical year. 85 is such a great year. Oh, yeah. Well, the lead singer, actually, we had an interview with him last spring from his place down in Florida, and it's Nasty Savage. Nasty ah, right on my list, bro. Dude, on oh. my list, too. <laughs> on my <laughs> list, brother. Well, well, that's why we're the fucking metal panel tonight. Ronnie Galetti. Uh, well, then let's get right into it. Ronnie Galetti, Nasty Savage. Unfortunately, the, the reoccurring theme of a lot of these bands, well, maybe the bands I brought along, is two, three albums. And then for some reason, like Bill said, bad management, uh, misfortune, drug addiction, booze. Uh, but, the you know, the first one, Nasty Savage, fucking no Ugh. sympathy, gladiator, fear behind the beyond the vision. Um, it goes on and on the morgue. And now, Chris, back in the day, I don't know how it was in D.C., but we had a strong um, myself included uh, local radio scene, uh, access college access, high school access channels that played a lot of this stuff. Oh, and, we did not. <laughs> oh, and that's what we had a chance to hear a lot of this. There was uh, the exposure. So, uh, Chris, 
So you're telling me nasty sandwiches on your list. What did you think about the band? I'll stick another one in its place later when it comes to that. But uh, dude, I love it. In fact, I penetration point for me was probably my favorite one. I love nasty savage. The, 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 the debut, but penetration point hit right for me at that time as a teenager, when I was out there, you know, breaking all the rules that I could find and create new rules to break. And that album is kind of a soundtrack to my life. Kind of a release, man. What a fantastic fucking band, dude. Yeah. Um, when when did you get into them? When did you get into them? Because definitely when the, the, definitely when the title track, well, you know, they're one of those bands again, it seems like there was so many bands that in my opinion, were about to go next level. And then that fucking grunge thing happened, man. And, you know, I'm on record. I know that you and me have talked about this in the past. I have a, a deep hatred for grunge and it's not necessarily the music itself as much as what I feel like it did to the other music I love. You know what I mean? It kind of put a damper on all my metal at the time, but, <laughs> but I got into nasty savage when the, I, I, I grew up with Vincent Matthews, who many may know who temporarily was a dying fetus. I've known him since we've been in kindergarten and shit. And we used to like trade tapes together back and forth. The nasty savage was one. He brought me a cassette of it once. and was like, check this out. And, that mm. was the self-titled uh, original release. But by the time I loved it, I loved indulgence, but for whatever reason, uh penetration point, man, just, I still play that regularly, honestly. So. I still play all of it, but abstract reality yeah. is probably my favorite. Just I, the tunes on there are sick. Yeah, the guitar what, work yeah. and it's like the riffage is, I wouldn't, I would call some of their, their riffs are, are like, uh, they're mesmerizing kind of circular spiraling, you know, they're, it, it, I don't know if that's a good description, but uh, I think so. Fantastic, actually. Yeah. yeah. And then they have these killer slam parts too that are just like, dun, 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 you know, you could bang your head, you could go off in the pit, you know, the whole nine yards. Great pit moments, man. Yeah. They oh, yeah. were definitely one of those early bands that were like, we're going to put this section in here so that people beat the fuck out of each other for, t- you know. <laughs> right. And I always appreciated that about them. Band, you know, after that uh, 88, 89, they, uh, they broke up. And then, you know, they had a couple start stops, a lot of inactivity. But Bill and uh, our one of the guys on our team, Southern Cal, had a chance to see him, what, a year ago, Bill? down in oh, Yeah, we saw year? him. All, it'll be a year ago in April. And and oh, I awesome. did see him a couple times in the 90s, too. They would get back together for, like, one-off shows, which was fantastic because those those were some sick shows, man. Very cool. Yep. What a badass right. thing, man. I didn't all hate right, Psycho Crypt. Psycho that came out in 2004, by the way. I didn't. It wasn't fantastic or anything, but I didn't dislike it. I I listened to it. Yeah, no, it's a good record. It's it, it to me, it's not up to par with the with earlier stuff, but it's still a great record. You know. Yeah. Fuck yeah. You and know, I listeners through too. Listeners throughout this, you're going to hear me refer to Chris as the Crypt. Why don't we? Uh, him and his uh, beautiful wife Scully run yes. this metal mania. How did you yes. guys get these nicknames? Uh, you know, what's funny is I, people who are just seeing me the first time probably will not, won't believe me here, but uh, years back, I weighed 450 pounds. I was a big fat guy and I had a, a walk. I still have a walking stick. I have knee problems and hip problems and stuff, but my friends would jokingly call me the crip, like the cripple, you know what I mean? Oh, uh, okay. And okay. my, <laughs> my daughter hated it that the, you know, she always, for whatever reason would defend me as if they were making fun of me, which of course they weren't, but it was lighthearted, but that morphed into her turning it into crypt, adding a T to it. And then, and then more and more people would play like music from the tales from the crib thing over my shit when I would start the show. And it kind of became the crypt over that. And Scully, I call Scully Scully because we we just celebrated 25 years together this week as my, a couple of weeks ago. But we, when we very first got together, we both got a horrible flu for like a week, and we sat at home binging. We made a literally a you know the pillow and blanket mm-hmm. fort out of the living room, and we watched X Files nonstop the whole time we were sick. And <laughs> by the end of it, she became Scully, and she's been Scully ever since. So. Right. <laughs> All right, well, Crypt, um, let's and I'm get sorry it. for you guys that she's not here right now because she's way better looking than I am, you guys. Way uh, better looking than me. So <laughs> well, it's all good. Uh y- your second entry into your top five. Se- and and she's yelling, by the way, uh, that all the hair metal stuff is underappreciated. But anyway, um, my next band is a band I love. I love, love, love. They have a small tie-in, even with the hat I'm wearing here in a little bit of a ways. But man, I'm gonna go with Chicago, Illinois Trouble. A band that I fucking, I, 
people who watch our show know kind of my backstory. We've jokingly referred to that we're going to add a show to our repertoire called my my big brother's record collection because that's kind of how i got into music i used to break into my big brother's room and listen to his records all the time nice you know i i got into every band that way black sabbath and ario speedwagon and fall hat and april wine all those come to mind but one that definitely stuck out was my first ever listening to the one of two self-titled troubles you know this band has two self-titled releases and both of them are among my favorite releases in musical history but um man the first time that i got my hands on a trouble record the the doomy, they were kind of my, you know, that real doom outside of what Black Sabbath brought me. They were kind of that doom thing that got me. And I've loved them ever since, man. Eric Wagner, you know, bad motherfucker. Yep. So, and of course, trouble since day one. Fucking love. Well, yeah, right. <laughs> and, <laughs> and of course, that was my name growing up. Before my nickname was The Crypt, it was Trouble. So that thing, you know. <laughs> well, but, you know, uh, uh, last spring, and, and listeners, I don't mean to do, uh, you know, the, the self promotion, what we do here. But oh, we had uh, Carl, Carl um, from uh, Legion of Doom on the show, and they have a new one coming out. Legion of Doom is an all-star tribute. They have Carl and, um, escapes me, um, uh, the guy from Corrosion of Conformity right, and a couple right. other guys. And so Legions of Doom would go out and, and uh, they, they had their own music, but on tour they would do Trouble, they would do The Skull, they would do um, some of uh, Eric's other solo stuff, so. Yeah, we grew up on Trouble. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, Bill, when, when did we see Trouble? They opened up for someone up at uh, Backstreets. I missed that show. Oh, well, that show, that was Trouble and Sabotage, actually. That was a later um, show. I think that was 89 or 90. But uh, uh, Trouble first played Rochester opening for King Diamond, I think. But I was living in New Jersey at that time. I love and, King Diamond. And I was at school in Toronto. So Okay. All right. Yeah. So, but I, I did see trouble a few times but i'd miss that 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 rochester show yeah i've been lucky to see him a few times back a long time ago now about though but yeah oh yeah you know <laughs> and great entry see. great they entry crap formed in 79 man a couple, couple of years ago just a couple yep well what do you got on your list what's your next cut uh next band the crumb suckers <clears throat> out of new york baldwin new york which uh is on Long Island, but they cut their teeth in the New York City hardcore metal scene. Uh, they were considered, to me, they were a hardcore band, but they were way more metal than they were like their contemporaries. Um, the guitar players were freaking both killer guitar players. I would say they're more from the Eddie Van Halen, Randy Rhodes uh, school of music than, say, Johnny Ramone. Um, just Thousand chock percent. full of killer guitar riffs and leads, lead breaks all over the place. Their tunes were short and fast, but there was tons of killer guitar in there. And oh. uh, they put out two albums, Life of Dreams and Beast on My Back. Uh, Life of Dreams came out in 86, Beast on My Back, 88. And they're two completely different records. Um, right on. So true. Yeah. I, I would say I like Life of Dreams a little better because that's how I got into them. But Beast on My Back is a killer record, too. It's just a little different. It's weird. It's like, uh, it's it, not more, I would say it's more traditional, but they still are avant-garde. They definitely weren't your average band you know, as far as how their songs go. And I would say the singer Chris Notoro's vocals were more akin to Lemmy than, say, Steve Perry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right on. <laughs> <laughs> Or, or I, even more so that than like a Henry Rollins type, you know what I mean? Like he yeah. was definitely, yeah, it was know. more like angry yelling and uh, kind of, kind of gruff, you know, more yeah. so than that. He's not singing. He's just, he's kind of yelling, but not, not yelling, screaming, yelling, but there's some, there's some, uh, you know, and some good, great lyrics, good uh, teenage angst and, you know, suburban decay type thing, well, war, yeah. all those themes the are in there shit you listen to real loud in your room to fucking rebel against your parents type of shit for sure that's right uh, what a great band man yeah i have often joked that crumb suckers are hard to define as straight hardcore because they're such great musicians usually Absolutely. you know and that's what separates them is they're actually great musicians that chose to do hardcore so right that's awesome i remember when bill um he spent some time down in jersey and he used to, you know, he'd come and visit. And this was all well before file sharing or anything like that. And I remember he came back and he gave me a, ca a cassette and it had, uh -huh. um, had like Mucky Pup on there. And, wow, um, a boy in a man's a, world. 
<laughs> a couple <laughs> of other of those uh, downstate, tri-state, that kind of stuff. So uh, great choice. Great choice. Right on. Now, Love it. You, great choice. You said, you said something a little while ago. I'm going to stay in Florida. And this band, even though they went on probably to uh, achieve, um, I don't want to say bigger heights, but they had many chapters, Sabotage. You know, nice. they came from, you know, the swamp area. And when, um, like I just said, they have a lot of different chapters, but the chapter that really we got into was right from the beginning, Crypt. This was, you know, we got Sirens. We saw that Sirens tour when it came out. And th- it, it's awesome because, you know, I always knew this, but after doing a little research for this, I never realized that they recorded all of Sirens and all of Dungeons Are Calling at the same time. Oh, I didn't know that actually either. It, yep. Yeah, all in one day. They recorded awesome. those. And then Dungeons Are Calling is the follow-up four or five song EP. And they're and, both amazing. Absolutely. Yes. And the brothers. It was, uh, you know, Chris Oliva, John Oliva. They had Dr. Killdrums. Uh, I can't even pronounce his last name. Uh, Bush Buckles. Holes. Yeah. <laughs> and... um. Uh, Collins, the 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 original uh, uh, ba- uh bass player, Keith. Collins. Uh, yes. So they had that. Kill- <laughs> there you go. Fact check. Love this they motherfucker. Had- I'm I'm loving you more every second, brother. I'm telling you. <laughs> <All right. laughs> why do you think? Why do you think we've been friends since '78? Mutual love, brother. <laughs> but the, 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 that's another example of these bands: Sirens, Dungeons, Power of the Night. It was like that that three pack. It was essentials. just essentials. It's absolutely essentials. And just like another, just like uh, you mentioned before, you know, these bands, they had a little success and then the big labels came sniffing around and dangling, you know, dollars and do this. And they did. They they, they had another they had another one. What was, what was that after uh, Power of the Night? Um, uh, well, uh, the whole, Fight for the Rock was. Fight for the yeah, rock. yeah, yeah, yeah. I like that one a little less. But of course, Hall of the Mountain King was, you know, that probably their biggest commercial yeah, they, success as far as yes. commercial goes. But to right. me, I think power of the night was their pinnacle as far as that early era. Just yeah. that, that Dun- I love the dungeons EP so much. Yeah. And dungeons. That's a sick album too. Yeah. And, yeah, and I'm not, and I'm not discrediting those chapters. That's why I had to say there's chapters and, you know, after right. power of the night and then they, you know, they, they started changing, but they, they changed their sound too. And, I'm not saying it was better. I'm just saying definitely that did, the, though, yeah. the period that we got into them, uh, that's when I fell in love with them. And I remember going to see them and just, oh, my God, it was uh, it was, they were, it was the show. They were, they were epic. Yeah, they were an epic, epic band. They were every song was very huge. It was a very, you know, I'm completely name dropping here, but we just had Chris Contos on the show recently. And when we were talking about some of his all time's favorite songs, but Sirens was the first one that popped out of it. He was like, "Man, Sirens! I hear that from Sabotage, and I'm ready to, I'm ready to go berserk still to this day." So nice, me too. Yes, you sir. know, you, you you look at that, and as a Sabotage fan, you look at that first one. It's like, it's like their first album's like a greatest hit. Sirens, I believe, Rage, Twisted Little Sister, On the Run, No, or on yeah, On the Run, and um, Out on the Streets. That was the first ballad. Even though later on they redid it and Embraced rearranged it. it. Right, right. So, well, um, Crypt, you're up, what man. A, what do you got? What a great fucking band, man. What a great fucking band. Uh, you know what? Next, I'm going to go with good old motherfucking Laz Rocket. Do you remember these guys? Nice. Man? Chicago? Just them earlier. O- Oakland, where, where they California sh- guys. Oh, uh, okay, okay. They put out for 84, 85, and then 87. They put out three records that I played over and over and over again. 89's Annihilation Principle probably is my favorite. Well, they, nothing sacred to 91, too. Would pro- those two might be my two favorite. But I got into them on those first three records when I was a younger teenager. And, man, what a fucking great band. You know, I, I even remember hearing, like, oh, they named their band after, you know, something to do with the Clint Eastwood movie fucking. And I was like, I got to check these guys out. and their entire discography for me is worth having. They put out even one in 2008 that I called left for dead that I think is a good fucking record. So I, I I've always loved this band, man. They, I early, they're kind of more power edged. Did they be, they morphed into more of a thrash riff driven band. And, you know, by then they were on fire. What a, what a kick-ass fucking bunch of dudes. 
I well, you're into them. C- City's going to burn. I mean, that's that's oh. the first. I, I love that album. That, that album is classic. Fans. It's so good, man. Sid, that was 84, man. I was a 13 year old yep. kid. I had a cassette of that and I played it until my record player, I mean, until my radio ate it and then I bought it again. And you know nice. what I mean? Like, what a great fucking. Uh, that that band was fucking i had the patches and the shit you know all of it baby awesome yep i saw them in 89 i think it was i finally oh, got to see them. Yeah. they on the annihilation yeah. principle run then man what yep. dude that that record i still listen to that record all the time you know? i do too nothing sacred all the time so crap do you ever see laws rocket live i did long i want to say yeah i think it was 89 too probably annihilation principle and I matter of fact, it was at the Capitol Center, and I believe it was with fucking Flotsam and Jetsam. Nice. Uh, another band who was this close to being on my list. I feel like they did kind of reach a little bit more of success, but, th- you know, they, I almost had them on my list, Flotsam and Jetsam. But, yeah, man. And matter of fact, I think it was them, Flotsam and Jetsam, and Sacred Reich. So what a tour. Oh, nice. Jesus. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Good shit. Uh, Bill, what do you got? What's number three on your list? All right. Number three is Sacred Right. R-I-T-E, not Reich. <laughs> Ah, no shit. Okay. And uh, they were more of a traditional band, a uh, traditional heavy metal. They were out of Honolulu, Hawaii, which was very unusual. Um, and they put out three awesome records, if you ask me. I, I got into them on their third record, which is uh, is Nothing Sacred. It came out in 1986. But before that, they had Sacred Rite in 1984, The Ritual in 1985. And definitely... Uh, traditional metal, you know, it's a lot of guitar, killer guitars, mid range vocals. Dude's a great singer, but he's, he's not really singing his ass off. Like, like, uh, like obsession singer, let's say, but uh killer guitar trade-offs and uh good catchy tunes that you can remember. They had a lot of memorable tunes oh, and I still listen to them this, to this day. Never did get to see them because they didn't tour that to my knowledge, but uh, I guess they were pretty big back in Hawaii. And then they actually moved to Oklahoma city of all places in 1987. And I guess they tried their thing at fame and it just, it fizzled out for them. Mm. So interesting. Yeah. I'm ordering right now based on your recommendation. Cause this is one I'm not familiar with, honestly. All right, well, if you're going to do that, they have two CDs called Rites of Passage Volumes 1 and 2, and it has all their stuff on there that you oh. need, to, all the stuff that that's yeah. essential. Now, they did put another record out in the 2000s. I can't remember the name of it. Um, unfortunately, their drummer had passed away, and they took some of his stuff and they sampled it. So it's kind of a weird record, to yeah, be honest okay. with you. But yeah. the Rites of Passage, I would, uh, Volumes 1 and 2, definitely get get those. Good stuff. Doing it. Own it. Right on. Okay, like I promised, I'm going to get my third cut in now, and we're going to the Great White North. You know, there's a lot of bands from Canada that have had major success. You know, you got your Rush, you got your Triumph. You know, Christ, even in the grunge area, you had Alanis Morissette. But, you know, when the 80s came, you know, you had Razor, you had uh, Anvil, you know, you had Kraken. But what you had... What's that? Infernal Majesty. I had to throw them in there, but go ahead. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> but you know, my my entry here is Exciter. Now, <sighs> here's an another example of a band that fucking came out of nowhere, had some success, and then not any faults of theirs, sort of gets screwed over. So you know, they get the band, they get the name from the old Judas Priest song, and you know, they sent in a uh, demo to Mike Varney over at Shrapnel, and they had that track "World War Three that made one of those. Oh, what was it? The uh, U.S. Metal Volume Two. So then they end up, uh, they do their first album, uh, "Heavy Metal Maniac," and it's fucking killer. And then they oh. instantly they get scooped up by um, Megaforce and Johnny Z, and they come out with "Violence and Force." And like I said, with the uh, with, with, with the uh, the sabotage, those albums are just like every track is a great, great track. And Crypt, we were very fortunate up here in Rochester to see all these bands come through. We had a local uh, heavy metal outlet called the Penny Arcade and a local uh, record, sh- record shop proprietor used to sponsor the Sunday afternoon shows. And Bill and I and... um. You know, the Penfield Poser Death Squad. It was our high school and like all those metalheads. We'd go down there on a Sunday. And one of the first shows that 
Ron Stein from the Lakeshore Record Exchange promoted was Exciter. And uh, Bill could attest to this. There Dude, we that, are. Sick show. 15-year-olds up there. Yeah. And it's the first, first chance we had to smell that fake uh, dry ice. Yeah. And these guys just come out uh, opening with under attack. And it was just awesome. Um, Crypt, what do you know about Exciter? And what's your experience with this band? Unfortunately, not a band I ever caught live, which is a which I wish I would have. But I a bit, I love 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 them though, man. That was another one where every year they were reliable when I was young, man. Literally every single year they put out a record for a stretch there that was a phenomenal, you know, welcome addition to the soundtrack of my teenage years. You know, my rebellion break shit years, as it were. <laughs> Heavy metal maniac, violence and force, long live the loud. You know, 83, 84, 85, 86. Yep. Not enough people love unveiling the wicked. I think it's great. I still I like Exciter. You know, a consistent kick-ass band for me for the in that perfect sweet spot of my teenage years too, man. You know, we're doing this list. Not only are we talking about the bands that we feel like we're one level maybe or two levels mm -hmm. below where they should have been, but a huge part of the, this list for this panel and I forgive me if I'm speaking for you guys too, but is the nostalgic angle. You know what I mean? Let's be honest. This is the stuff that we it means a lot to you and to me because it's with the shit that you know was a part of the soundtrack to our life through those years man and right. you know Ex exciter was is a staple absolute staple i didn't I say it any better and just like the other bands the, like some of these bands they just uh imploded before the grunge really came even though you know exciter continued they had releases in 92 and 97 um they weren't necessarily a victim and I use this loosely, a victim of the grunge era, because let's admit it, guys, a lot of the bands that came out of the 80s, this was self-induced sure. problems, you know, yeah. but uh, but Exciter. And I had a chance to see them. Uh, fuck, when was it? This past summer? When, where are we now? We're in February. October. Yeah, this, was in it. Uh, October. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they oh, came right, up to right. Rochester and... Yeah. um. Uh, I, I printed out some pictures from an in-store they had and gave it the... Uh, Dan Beeler, and he's looking at it, he's like, holy shit. And, you know, it's just one of those bands. Love it, Bill. Uh, I think you got me into Exciter, to tell oh. you the truth. Yeah, they're just, they were one they were one of those early bands. And I remember hearing them on, uh, on Metallic Overdrive and going, yep. holy shit, these guys are sick. You know, and it was like that short era between traditional and thrash metal. And they were right in the middle of that. And you could say they're they're more definitely in the thrash realm of things, but they still had that traditional metal uh, metal isms to them. But they were they were the next wave, I guess you know. And when you when I thought of them, I just think of studs and leather and just you know brutality because they were brutal. They were, and they were, they were. just John Ricky on guitar, just uh, you know Dan, just it was, it was like a buzzsaw blade. Were they yeah. on one of the Metal Massacre? I can't. Were they on one of those releases, one of those compilations? I feel like I they were on one of them. I don't think so, but if they oh. were, it was a later one that I probably right, didn't get right. into. But I might early be thinking on. of the Metal Hammer ones too. So, but, yeah, but yeah. What a great band! What a great choice, yeah. brother! What a great choice, Johnny! All right, Crypt Four. What do you that, got? That is good, good stuff, man. That is good, good stuff. Uh, you know, I'm. It, it's hard to pick the bands off of my list because I love them all so much, man. <laughs> let's go next with let's go with fucking uh i know i have so many on my list you know what let's let's stay a little doomy man let's go with pentagram i don't feel like pentagram was a band that gets i don't feel like they still get enough love for what they did you know what i mean they're a band that fucking I, and of course i'm talking about the you uh the uh washington dc version the doom metal band pentagram i know mm -hmm. there's a few bands out there but 85's self-titled 87's day of wrecking reckoning and even 93's relentless you know those are hallmark records in my life man that and i'm surprised even now actually i'll talk to people that are unfamiliar with this band and i don't understand how that's possible you know they're right in that line of kind of the trouble that i talked about earlier maybe in that saint vitus kind of witch finder general you know flavor if you will but man an underappreciated underloved band for me yeah, I would agree. I don't know why, but they definitely flew under the radar. I mean, people diehards, of course, are into them, but it, right, the, right. you know, they're definitely not a household name. Yeah. And they should be, man. In my opinion, they should, you know, for what Metallica is to thrash, I very much feel like Pentagram plays a role in the Doom metal game. For sure. You know? Absolutely. You know? 
they were they were formed in 71 they were on the cusp of that you know they were what they're that perfect bridge between the doomy black sabbathy sound to the more aggressive kind of a doom stuff you know what i mean so i right it's such a hallmark band for me so Rip, let, let me ask you why do you think they didn't elevate to that next level was it i you know i think that some people were got their doom from sabbath and they were good with that honestly i don't know i you know i it it was Mm -hmm. kind of that next level of doom before people were ready for it i guess because now i feel like had they come out 10 years later they would have been they would have hit like a a a bomb you know what was what was their um timeline when was the first one when was the last significant one the self-titled came out in 85 and for me that was a hallmark record that i i put on that record the first time i ever had it as a 14 year old teenager even and listen to it over and over and over again, you know, and like it was a whole new sound. It was so thoroughly, you know, they, they embraced that down tone to D and fucking kind of pummeled you with it, man. It was, well, and now let's not discount the fact that I, I would be remiss in my, my duties as the whole story here. If I didn't include the fact that I was becoming a huge stoner at the time. So <laughs> if, if you, <laughs> Yeah. If you factor in my love for bong hits, it, it hit right at my love for pentagram, and it was a perfect merging, if you will. So, right on. It, That's it was how nothing I was better than Black Sabbath a few years earlier today. Right, that. exactly. Right, you know. <laughs> yeah, but now weren't aren't they from your area? Weren't they from that? Uh, they Maryland? are. Yeah, they're DC. They're right here in my backyard. Yes. Sir. Okay. Yes, sir. All right. I've seen them a whole bunch of times, like more than I can count, even. So. I bet. Yeah, I never did get to see them. They never oh. properly toured back in the day, or at least came to my where i was great you know. live yeah they weren't a big road warrior necessarily band but now they but did play rochester records, a few though. years ago but i for some reason i don't know why i missed that show and but, uh, i'm actually looking at their page right now technically it looks like they're still together again it looks like they've gotten together and broken up quite a few times over the years oh yeah but, oh yeah but, they uh, probably have a totally inconsistent lineup uh, as yeah, far right. as <laughs> And there's probably uh, like one original guy that has carried the name and the singer dude uh what's his name yeah uh geez, yeah I let's can't... see well bobby leeling on vocal liebling on vocals That's is yep. back from the day victor griffin has been around since 83 so he's got some got some pedigree there so okay yeah but yeah the other guys came along not greg turley in the 90s and minnesota pete campbell joined in 2015 so all right oh crap yeah, you're, great, in a great do- you're in a doom mood tonight is yeah two or your four yeah two or your four uh bill what do you got for your fourth well, yeah, I had uh nasty savage. We we both picked that together, but I'll just throw off the top of my head violence. Mm. Uh, if the okay. album Eternal Nightmare is a thrash classic and a, a totally essential, I I believe in in uh, thrash metal. That that's uh that's the top of the peak peak for me. Now they're part of that Frisco scene, right? Yes, yes sir. yep, yes sir. They're yeah. a little late in the game as far as the Frisco seen or that album came out in 88 but well they're the second wave with the testaments yes. and yes. uh yes it wasn't there the other sacred reich from sacred out there reich. no they're from they're phoenix. arizona right yeah yep. yeah they're from okay. phoenix right who was or the Tucson, second maybe. what's the second wave of frisco thrashers yeah you uh, uh forbidden forbidden uh, yeah. testament fucking uh maybe even heathen would probably be a part of heathen, that i yeah, guess so. yeah, yeah um yeah yeah you know well you had sean killian from violence on my show a couple of years sadist. ago and oh dude the new sadist by the way oh but anyway yeah. um but sean killian went to high school with cliff burton you know he he was telling us stories about smoking joints with cliff burton in high school and shit that was awesome man that was, right a, on. That was a big land for i just sat there smiling like a dipshit through the whole interview like oh you know <laughs> but uh because i i agree man violence is a great band internal nightmare for me is on my, you know, Mount Rushmore of thrash metal records, man. What a great Me release. Too. I we mean, they, the, a, sec, the second go, one, uh, yeah. what, what, uh, it came out in 1990. The masses Oppressing whatever, the Mass. Yeah. Good right. album, but it was a totally different sound. Yeah, definitely. The the uh, Eternal had almost a punk delivery and a thrash metal casing, you know? Yes. Yeah, so, absolutely. I loved it. Loved it. Phobophobia and Serial Killer. Oh, good shit, man. Yep. Wow. You guys are, uh, you, you're going deep into the bench. You know, uh, uh, my my fourth, um, uh, Widowmaker. I'm going nice. into the night and going into '92, but yeah. when Twisted Sister finally, you know, called it a day, 
th- this is a fun story. D, um, you know, hung around for a minute, put another band together called Desperado. And they got signed to Electra. They did the album two weeks before it was about to release. They uh, pulled the plug on it. And he's like, what the fuck? So he had to wait like a year for some. Besides, they pulled the plug on the project. He had to like wait a year to do anything. So he put another band together, Widowmaker, with Al Petrelli, Joe Franco on drums from the Good Rats, Mark Russell, who was an English guy that comes into play. And they released the debut Blood and Bullets. And at the time, it was 92. And me and a buddy of mine, we just got into it. We had a chance to see the tour a couple of times in that album. That the blood and bullets, some of the best songs on that was music that they wrote for Desperado with uh Bernie Torme, the oh, wow. Irish guitarist and songwriter. And you know, th- those songs, uh, and then that was the um the partnership, but uh that first one, uh, Blood and Bullets. Are you guys familiar with it? Crypt? Are you oh, yeah, yes, sir. I, in fact, Stan, their their sophomore release, Stand By for Pain, I think was a fantastic record, too, man. Yeah. Good stuff. It, it, I'm a huge fan of D. Snyder all my life, man. When he went in there and embarrassed them assholes in Congress, I yeah. decided on that day, everything this man does, I will follow and I will support it. So, <laughs> and it's funny that you mentioned Stand By for Pain because it was uh, 94, and they um, it's a great album. Great it, album. There's yeah. parts of it now. Blood and Bullets. It was it was like heavy Twisted Sister. It was like. I don't want to even say it was like Twisted Sister because it wasn't, but Al Petrelli, who had success with Alice Cooper and he was in Sabotage for a minute and other acts, he just killed it. He just Yo. absolutely killed it. Yeah. You know, you know, the, some of those songs on that, uh, you know, um, uh, The Widowmaker, Snot Nose Kid, uh, Blood and Bullets, um, Blue for You, Calling for You. These, uh, the, the guitar work was great, but Stand By for Pain, they made a conscious effort to, uh, I try to get a little grungier or the, the sound and yeah, uh, it's Messy. a great album, but oh, they didn't. Yeah. Bill, what's your experience with? I had that uh, first Widow album Mickey. on cassette and unfortunately I, it, it got eaten and I never replaced it. So my, you know, we're talking, the only time I hear them is on your radio show. And I keep saying to myself, damn it. I got to get that album again. Cause that's such an awesome album. Mm-hmm. And I got to ask you, where did you see them? Cause I, I don't remember them touring at all. I saw him a, a couple times uh, in Rochester. Saw him at um, 3Ds. We saw him at Pine- Pineapple Jacks, and oh, it was so hell. Did I was, miss those shows, man? <laughs> I don't know, but it was so grassroots that I remember at these shows they had little postcards that they asked their fans to hype their friends and uh, you know really? get into. Grabbed the whole stack of them, and I, you know, we, we'd go down and we'd go to the bar, and I'd have my buddies fill it out. And the original Instagram, my, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you know, I saw him a couple times, and to this day, like, um, th- love it. So I must have been bullets, not living in Rochester. I would have definitely went to that show, those shows. Yeah, I must have sure. already moved to Tampa or something. Well, it was ninety two. Really? Oh, uh, yeah. I don't know. I'm, I don't so, know what. <laughs> I don't know how I missed that. Huh. Blood and well, bullets, baby. You, you know what? We got uh, we got a little time left. Um, I had a more. I had a couple. I'm gonna just go down my list. Uh, quick honorable mentions. Yeah, I'd like to throw uh, a few out too. If I uh, uh, honorable mentions, I had Anvil. You know, uh, uh, another Canadian band. You know, and one another, of the greatest documentaries too. By the way, I love that documentary about them. Look oh yeah, that. they had another one of those uh, triplets. Uh, hard and heavy, uh, metal on metal, forged in fire. And, you know, and then they, they, they've been consistently just releasing stuff. You ever notice uh, each one of their albums have three words in it? Uh, yes. no, not that's, until you said so, but now I did. That, that's the thing. <laughs> and um, and okay. another band that I was really into um, had a great another two, three albums was Fastway. Uh, you know, uh, I have them on my honorable list, mention list. Yeah, you know, Fast Eddie Clark, Pete Way. The ironic thing was Pete Way never, uh, when it was time to record the album, he was still under contract with Chrysalis. But then, so he couldn't do the album. Um, but, but then it was weird because like three months later, he uh, he starts uh, Wasted. And it's like, in any case, so they had their nice run, the debut. Wasted was good too, but. Uh, then the follow-up and then the trick-or-treat and, but. 
one of my favorite soundtracks ever, even still, you know, the trick or treat. Yeah. So yeah. crypt. So yeah. crypt. You, uh, you got a couple of quick honorable mentions. What do you got? Yeah. Let me throw a few out there. Grim Reaper. Does everybody remember Grim Reaper with CUNL oh, yeah. and all that stuff, man? Mm-hmm. Under the, uh, discharge. Remember Raven, the United Kingdom version of Raven. I was a big fan of them. Demon Steeler. Nobody mentioned Steeler. I thought maybe we got them. Some Arbored Saint, Omen, Trauma, Warlock. Don't forget Warlock, Carnivore, and uh, let's say Cryptic Slaughter. Okay, sorry. And nice. Toxic. Don't forget the Thrash Band Toxic with the K. Yep, yep. Also, yeah, another great band. Yeah, yeah. They're back together, I guess, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, and remember Rigor Mortis, man? What a great oh, band. Yeah. Rigor- yeah. Yeah. Texas. Well, yeah. And Raven was on my honorable. You, you know, the, the, and the thing with the Raven was, the, you know, the first string with uh, Wacko Hunter you know, wiped out all for one. Yeah. But they were, yeah, but they were another one, you know, those, uh, major labels dangling that dollar. And then next thing, you know, they have spiked hair, but then, (laughs) but then the last couple, you know, everyone, uh, you know, extermination, uh, and then, uh, Mike Heller came into the band with uh, metal city. And then the new one, um, is, is good stuff. Uh, Bill, what would you have? I have a piece of fun fact news I want to sh- share with you guys, but what, what's some honorables you have? Uh, well, Raven was definitely one of them. And uh, and then Crocus, they're another band. I ah, love the early Crocus stuff up too. until Headhunter. And, you know, and after that, they had some okay tunes, but they totally, they got they they de- got that carrot dangled and they went for the hair metal. You know, yeah. Yeah, pretty yeah. much. But they, Same they're plan. those early albums, even though they sounded like ACDC, I freaking love that stuff. Yeah, me that's, too, man. That that's some good stuff. You know, they famously had a war with D. Snyder and all that. You know, they yes. had a big thing. Yeah, it's I, oh. I I never knew that until a few years ago. I read this whole yeah. article about it, and it kind of sucks that they haven't buried the hatchet. I guess the yeah, uh, the so. singer tried to with with D, but he wasn't Ooh, having it. So and, right. yeah, what well, uh, D's wife Suzette made some stage clothes, and no one paid for it. And yeah, yeah, yeah and he guess, he will back out of anything that they're involved with. He won't do it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I like not even playing shows. I read that in yeah. that fun fact that uh, it involves D and Widowmaker. They're um, touring bass player for uh, back on that standby for pain was uh, uh, Freddie Volano, who happens to be the new bass player of the Rods, another ah. band. And uh, the Rods just released a new album, Rattle the Cage. Damn. So, you know, it's, it's all 40, incestuous, isn't it? The 40 years, <laughs> it all intertwines. And Fuck look yeah. at it. And this is a perfect example of what our community uh, has to offer. Bill and I have been friends since 78. You and I connected a couple of years ago. You guys met 23 seconds ago. That's so right. We all could <laughs> friends share. for life, bro. That's right. We could all share the same story. And, the, and I'm going to tell you a quick story how Bill and I became friends. It was uh, sixth grade. And um, where we went to school, we had uh, different elementary schools. So Bill came from one. I came from another. Walked into our homeroom and there's Bill and he has an Ace Freely folder. And I'm like, dude, this, yeah. And, you know, not <laughs> much it. is ch- not much has changed since 1978. <laughs> Still right. sitting around here. That's so, awesome. um, Fuck yeah. well, hey, Crypt, I want to thank you for taking the time uh, to come here again. The platform Metal Omania Crypt. Where could people find your product? When are you on? And what's the game plan for spring of 2024? We're pushing hard on the YouTube thing. We used to be on StreamSpot. We've left that behind. We're trying to really put our energies into YouTube. So please, please, please sub us over there, you guys. We appreciate it. We're trying to be in every other week show right now with the amount of editing that I do. It takes a little time to create it. But I have some great interviews lined up. We have Atrophy coming on. We have Crazy Mad Rod coming on. I got Massacre coming on later in the year. Um, uh, Kyle Thomas from X Orders hopefully coming on soon. So we got some really good interviews in, in store for everybody. So. Cool. That's that's great stuff. And besides having a top YouTube uh, podcast that Chris does, he's also a two time um, a host of the Tennessee Metal Festival that our very own Zach Moonshine and uh, Raven Moonshine do. Uh, just quickly tell us your involvement with that. And are you going to be back in 2024? I'm so glad you brought that up. In fact, I've just this week been officially asked to return for the third Tennessee Metal Devastation Festival. I love Zach and Raven. Please show them all the love and support. What a fantastic uh, group of people doing great things for our scene. Basically, they I, I love it. I get to MC the bands. I go up there and tell my vulgar, dirty jokes all day. I introduce all the bands all day. Um, it's a blast, man. It's really becoming 
a tradition that's growing, and this will be our third one this year. I believe it's October 5th. Please look it up and try to get out there, man. I'd love to shake hands with as many metal fans as we can get out there. Come on out and party with me. Definitely. And you could find Bill. He's part of our Metal Mayhem ROC team. He's involved with the history of metal and shows like this, the rock and roll detention. So, uh, again, everyone, get up to MetalMayhemROC.com. Join our community by signing up for the newsletter. Uh, like and subscribe and support all these platforms. Metal Devastation Radio, Metal Mayhem ROC, Metalomania, and do yourself a favor. Get out, buy some product, and always, always, always remember to keep it heady. I'm the Vernomatic. This is Metal Mayhem ROC. Thanks for having me, brother. Metal for Life. Thank you for listening to Metal Mayhem ROC. Check out our website at MetalMayhemROC.com for information on podcasts, archives, links to all our live radio shows, and all sorts of info. Please like, follow, and share with everyone, even your non-metal friends. And always remember to keep it heavy.